from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Buick Saloon by Anne Burridge. To Mrs. James St. George Bernard Balby, it seemed almost providential that she should recover from the series of illnesses which had perforce kept her in England at the precise moment when Bulby was promoted from being number two to being number one in the Grand Oriental Bank in Peking. Her improved health and his improved circumstances made it obvious that now at last she should join him, and she wrote to suggest it. Bulby, of course, agreed, and out she came. He went down to meet her in Shanghai, but business having called him further still to Hong Kong, Mrs. Bowlby proceeded to Peking alone and took up her quarters in the big, ugly, gray brick house over the bank in Legation Street. She tried, as many managers' wives had tried before her, to do her best with the solid mahogany and green leather furniture provided by the bank, wondering the, the while how Bowlby, so independent, always on the feminine touch on his life and surroundings, had endured the lesser solidities of the sub-manager's house alone for so long. She bought silks and blackwood and scroll paintings. She also bought a car. You'll need a car and you'd better have a saloon because of the dust, Bowlby had said. People who came to Peking without motors of their own seldom buy new ones. There are always second-hand cars going from many sources. The leavings of transferred diplomatists, the jetsam of financial ventures, the sediment of conferences. So one morning, Mrs. Bowlby went down with Thompson, the new number two in the bank, to Maxon's garage, and then Na Shizu to choose her car. After much conversation with a Canadian manager, they pitched on a Buick saloon. It was a Buick of the type which is practically standard in the Far East and had been entirely repainted outside, a respectable dark blue the inside had been newly done up in a pleasant soft gray which appealed to mrs bowlby the manager was loud in its praises the suspension was excellent you want that on these roads mrs bowlby the driver and his colleagues sat outside much better mr thompson if these fellows have been eating garlic they shouldn't but do thompson knew they did and agreed heartily Mrs. Bowlby, new to such transactions, wanted to know whom the car had belonged to. The manager was firmly vague. This was not a commission sale. He had bought the car when the owner left. Very good people from the quarter. His fully satisfied Thompson, who knew that only Europeans live above the rose anyhow, at the legation quarter of Peking. So the Buick Saloon was bought. Thompson, having heard at the club that the late Grand Oriental chauffeur drank petrol, then not re-engage him with the rest of the servants according to custom, but secured instead for Mrs. Bowlby, the chauffeur of a departing manager of the Bank Franco-Belge. By the time Bowlby returned from Hong Kong, the chauffeur and his colleagues had been fitted out with khaki livery for winter, with white for summer, in either case with trim gold cuff and hat bands, and Mrs. Bowlby in her Bue saloon had settled down to pay her calls. In Peking, the newcomers call first, a curious and discouraging system. It is an ordeal even to the hardened. Mrs. Bowlby was not hardened. She was a small, shy, frail woman who wore gray by preference and looked gray. Gray, eyes, hair, and skin. She had no idea of asserting herself, 
And if she had things in her, subtleties, delicacies, she did not wear them outside. She did not impose herself. She hated the calls. But as she was also extremely conscientious day after day, trying to fortify herself by the sight of the two cocky and gold figures in front of her exhaling their possible garlic to the outer air beyond the glass partition, she called. She called on the diplomats' wives in the quarters. She called on the salt, who were officials of the salt gabelle. She called on the customs, English, Italian, American, and French. She called on the posts, French, Italian, American, and English. The annual displacement of pasteboard in Peking must amount to many tons. And in this useful work, Mrs. Bowlby, alone in the gray interior of her car, faithfully took her share. She carried with her a little list on which, with the help of her number one boy, as much a permanent fixture in the bank house, almost as the doors and windows, she had written out the styles, titles, and addresses of the ladies she wished to visit. The late chauffeur of the bank, Franco Belge, spoke excellent French. So did Mrs. Bowlby. It was one of her few accomplishments. But as no Chinese can or will master European names, the Europeans need must learn and use the peculiar versions current among them. Ta Chin Chai, Tai Tai Turko Fu, read out Mrs. Bowlby when she wished to call the wife of the German minister. We, oui, madame, said Shuang, Pei Tai Tai Kong Xing Ha Ung, read out. Mrs. Bowlby, when visiting Mrs. Bray, the doctor's wife, but when she wished to call on Mrs. Bennett, the wife of the commandant of the English guard, and Mrs. Baines, chaplain's wife, she found that they were both Pei Tai Tai Tu, which led to confusion. It began towards the end of the first week. Possibly it was her absorption in the lists and the Chinese names that prevented her from noticing it sooner. But at the end of that week, Mrs. Bowlby would have sworn that she heard French spoken beside her as she drove about. Once, a little later, as she was driving down the Rue Marco Polo to fetch her husband from the club, a voice said, C'est lui, in an underbreath eagerly, or so she thought. The windows were lowered and Mrs. Bowlby put it down to the servants in front, but it persisted. More than once, he thought, she heard a soft sigh. Nerves, thought Mrs. Bowlby. Her nerves were always a menace, and Peking, she knew, was bad for them. She went on saying nerves for two or three more days, then one afternoon she changed her mind. She was driving along the Tai Chang and Che, the great thoroughfare running east and west outside the legation quarter, where the trams ring and clang past the scarlet walls and golden roofs of the Forbidden City, and long lines of camels coming in with coal from the country as they have come for centuries, crossed the road between the Dodges and Daimlers of the new China. It was a soft, brilliant afternoon in April, and the cinder track along the glacis of the quarter was thronged with riders. Polo had begun, and as the car neared Hadaman Street, she caught a glimpse of the white and scarlet figures through the drifting dust on her right. At the corner of the Hadaman, the car stopped, a string of camels was passing up to the great gateway, and she had to wait. She sat back in the car, glad of the pause, she was unusually moved by the loveliness of the day, by the beauty and strangeness of the scene, by the whole magic of spring in Peking. She was going later to watch the polo, a terrifying game she wished Jim didn't play. Suddenly, across her idle thoughts, a voice spoke her clearly. Au revoir, it said. Mon très cher, ne tombe pas, je t'en prie. And as the car moved forward, Behind the last of the camels, soft and unmistakable, there came a sigh, and the words, C'est polo, que sport afro, Dieu, je, que je les déteste, in a passionate undertone. That wasn't the chauffeur, was what Mrs. Bowlby found herself saying. The front windows were up, and besides that low, rather husky voice, the cultivated and clear accent, could not be confounded for a moment with Schwang's guttural French. And besides, 
what chauffeur would talk like that? The thing was ridiculous. And it wasn't nerves this time, said Mrs. Bowlby, her thoughts running this way and that round the phenomenon. She did say it. Then it was who said Sehui before, she said almost triumphantly a moment later. Curiously, though she was puzzled and startled, she realized presently that she was not in the least frightened. That someone with a beautiful voice should speak French in her car was absurd and impossible, but it wasn't alarming. In her timid way, Mrs. Bowlby rather prided herself on her common sense, and as she shopped and called, she considered this extraordinary occurrence from all the common sense points of view that she could think of, but it remained a baffling and obstinate fact. Before her drive was over, she found herself wishing simply to hear the voice again. It was ridiculous, but she did, and she had her wish. As the car turned into Legation Street, an hour later, she saw that it was too late to go to the polo. The last chuka was over, and the players were leaving the ground, or which dust still hung in the low brilliant light, in cars and rickshaws. As she passed the gate, the voice spoke again, almost in front of her, this time as though the speakers were leaning forward to the window. Le voilà, it said, and then quite loudly, shock. Mrs. Bowlby almost leaned out of the window herself to look for whoever was being summoned. As she sat back, conscious of her folly, she heard again, beside her quite low, In the mapa view. There was no mistake about it. It was broad daylight. There she was in her car bowling along Legation Street, past the Belgian bank, past the German legation, rickshaw skimming in front of her, Madame de Rian bowing to her, and just as clear and certain as all these things had been, this woman's voice, calling to Jacques, whoever he was, terrified lest he should fail a polo, hating the game for his sake. What a lovely voice it was. Who was she? Mrs. Bowlby wondered. And what and who was Jacques? Mon cher, she had called him, a delicious expression. It belonged to the day and the place. It was near to her own mood, as she had sat at the corner of the Hadaman, and noticed the spring and hated the polo too for Jim's sake. She would have liked to call Jim Mon Trecher, only he would have been so surprised. The thought of Bowlby brought her up with a round turn. What would he say to this affair? Instantly, though, the, she prolonged the discussion with herself for form's sake. She knew that she was not going to tell him. Not yet, anyhow. Bowlby had not been very satisfied with her choice of a car as it was. He said it was too big and too expensive to run. Besides, there was the question of her nerves. If he failed to hear the voice, too, she would be in a terribly difficult position. But there was more to it than that. She had a faint sense that she had been eavesdropping, however involuntarily. She had no right to give away even a voice which said mon cher in that tone. This feeling grew upon her in the days that followed. The voice that haunted the Buick became of almost daily occurrence, furnishing a curious secret background to her social routine of calls and at-homes. It spoke always in French, always to or about Jacques, a person who, ever he was, greatly loved. Sometimes it was clear to Mrs. Bowlby that she was hearing only half of a conversation between the two as one does at the telephone. The man's voice she never heard, but, as at the telephone, she would often guess at what he said. Much of the speech was trivial enough. Arrangements for meetings, at lunches, at the polo, but weekend parties at Mao, Pao Chung, in the temple of this person or that. This was more eerie than anything else to Mrs. Bowlby. The hearing of plans concerned with people she knew. Alors, dimanche porcelain, chez les mines, meeting les mines. Soon after, she would stare at them, uneasily, as though by looking long enough, she might find about them some trace of the presence which was more familiar to her than their own. Her voice was making ghosts of the living, 
but whether plans or snatches of talk about people or ponies, there came always sooner or later the undernote of tenderness. Now hesitant, now frank, the close concern, the monopolizing happiness of a woman in love. It puzzled Mrs. Bowlby that the car should only register, as it were, the woman's voice. But then the whole affair bristled with puzzles. Why did Bowlby hear nothing? For he did not. She would have realized her worst fears if she had told him. She remembered always the first time that the voice spoke when he was with her. They were going to a Te d'Ansant at the Peking Hotel, a farewell party for some minister. As the car swung out of the Jade Canal Road past the policemen who stand with fixed bayonets at the edge of the classis, the voice began suddenly, as it so often did in French. Then I leave thee now. That will send back the car. And as they lurched across the tram lines towards the huge European building and pulled up, it went on. But tonight, one will dance. N'est pas? Goodness, what a crowd, said Bowlby. This is going to be simply awful. Don't let's stay long. Will half an hour be enough, do you think? Mrs. Bowlby stared at him without answering. Was it possible? She nearly gave herself away in the shock of astonishment. What's the matter, said Bowlby? What are you looking at? Bowlby had not heard a word. She noticed other things. There were certain places where the voice came through, so to speak, more clearly and regularly than elsewhere. Intermittent fragments, sometimes unintelligible, occurred anywhere. But she came to know what to expect to hear most. Near the polo ground, for instance, which she hardly ever passed without hearing some expression of anxiety or pride. She often went to the polo, for Jim was a keen and brilliant player, but it was a horror while he played, and this feeling was a sort of link, it seemed to her, between her and her unseen companion. More and more, too, she heard it near the Hadaman and the Hutungs, or alleys, to the east of it. Mrs. Bowlby liked the East City. It lies rather in a backwater between the crowded, noisy thoroughfare of Hadaman Street with his trams, dust, cars, and camels, and the silent angle of the Tartar wall, rising above the low one-story houses. A good many Europeans lived there, and she was always glad when a call took her that way. Through the narrow hood tongues, where the car lurched over heaps of rubbish or skidded in the deep dust, and rickshaws pulled aside into gateways to let her pass. Many of these lanes, and vaguely in big open spaces, where pigs root among the refuse and little boys wander about, singing long monotonous songs with a curious jerky rhythm in their high nasal voices. Sometimes as she waited before a scarlet door, a flute player out of sight would begin to play and the thin sweet melody filled the sunny air between the blank gray walls. Flowering trees showed here and there above them. Copper smiths plied their trade on the steps of carved marble gateways, Dogs and beggars sunned themselves under the white and scarlet walls of temple courtyards. Here, more than anywhere else, the voice spoke clearly, freely, continuously, the rounded French syllables falling on the air from nowhere, now high, light, and merry, with teasing words and inflection, now sinking into low murmurs of rapturous happiness. At such times, Mrs. Bowlby sat wholly observed and listening drawn by the lovely voice into a world not her own, and held fascinated by the spell of this passionate adventure. Happy as she was with Bowlby, her life with him had never known anything like this. He had never wanted, and she had never dared to use, the endearments lavished by the late owner of the Buick Saloon on her Jacques. She heard enough to follow the course of the affair pretty closely. They met when they couldn't public, but somewhere in the Chinese city, there was clearly a meeting place of their own. No petit asil, and gradually this haven began to take shape in Mrs. Bowlby's mind. Joyce references were made to various features of it. Tomorrow they would drink tea on the stone table under our great white pine. There was a fish pond shaped like a shamrock, where one of the goldfish died. Portant en Ilan, c'est la porte bon air et trif. The parapet of this pond broke away and had to be repaired, and Jacques, 
made some sort of inscription in the damp mortar, for the voice thrilled softly one day as it murmured. Maintenant, il s'élite la peau toujours ton amour, and all through that enchanted spring. First the lilac bushes perfumed the hours spent beneath the pine, and then the acacias that stood in a square round the shamrock pond. Still, more that life and her seemed to Mrs. Bowlby strangely mingled. Her own lilacs bloomed and scented the courtyard behind the Grey Bank building, and one day, as I drove to lunch in the British legation, she drew Jim's attention to the scene of the acacias, which drowned the whole compound in perfume. But Bowlby said with a sort of shiver that he hated the smell, and he swore at the chauffeur in French, which he spoke even better than his wife. The desire grew on Mrs. Bowlby to know more of her pair, who and what they were, and how their story ended. But it seemed wholly impossible to find out. Her reticences made her quite unequal to sending anyone on to question the people at the garage again. And then one day, accidentally, the clue was given to her. She had been calling at one of the houses in the French legation. The two house servants in blue and silver gowns stood respectfully on the steps. Her footman held open the door of the car for her. As she seated herself, the voice said in a clear tone of command, Du centrant, pour hua chan he tongue. Acting on an impulse which surprised her, Mrs. Bowlby repeated the order. Du centrant, pour hua chan he tongue. She said, Shuang's colleague bowed, and shut the door, but she caught sight as she spoke of the faces of the two servants on the steps. Was it imagination? Surely not. She would have sworn that a flicker of some emotion, surprise and recollection, had appeared for a moment on their sealed and impassive countenance. In Peking, the servants in legation houses are commonly handed on from employer to employer, like the furniture and the fact struck on her with sudden conviction. They had heard those words before. Her heart rose with excitement as the car swung out of the compound into Legation Street. Where was it going? She had no idea where the poor Hua Shan Hotong was. Was she about to get a stage nearer to the solution of the mystery at last? At the Hadaman, the Buick turned south along the glacis. So far, so good. The left the Hadaman bumped into the Su Cha Hotong, followed on down the Tong Sung Pu Hut Tong right into the heart of the East City. Her breath came fast. It must be right. Now they were skirting the edge of one of the rubbish strewn open spaces, and the east wall rose close ahead of them. They turned left, parallel with it, turned right again towards it, stopped. Shuan beckoned to a pancake seller, who was rolling out his wares in a doorway, and a colloquy in Chinese ensued. They went on slowly then down a lane between high walls, which ended at the wall's very foot, and pulled up some hundred yards short of it, before a high scarlet door, whose rows of golden knobs and five betokened the former dwelling of some Chinese of rank. It was only when Liu came to open the door and held out his cotton-gloved hand for her cards, that Mrs. Bowlby realized that she had no idea what she was going to do. She could not call on a voice. She summoned Shuang. Liu's French was not his strong point. Ask, she said to Shuang, who lives here? The Tai Tai's name. Shuang rang the bell. There was a long pause. Shuang rang again. There came a sound of shuffling feet inside, creaking on its hinges. The door opened, and the head of an old Chinaman, thinly bearded and topped with a little black cap, appeared in the crack. A conversation followed, and then Shuang returned to the car. The house is empty, he said. Ask him who lived there last, said Mrs. Bowlby. Another and longer conversation followed, but at last, Shuang came to the window with the information that a foreign Tai Tai, Faku Tai Tai, French lady, he thought had lived there, but she had gone away. 
With that, Mrs. Bowlby had to be content. It was something. It might be much. The car had moved on towards the wall, seeking a place to turn, when an idea struck her. Telling Shrank to wait, she got out and glanced along the foot of the wall in both directions. Yes, some two hundred yards from where she stood, one of those huge ramps used in former times to ride or drive up to the summit of the wall descended into the dusty strip of wasteland at its foot. She hurried towards it, nervously picking her way through the rough, fallen lumps of stone and heaps of rubbish. She was afraid that the servants would regard her action as strange, and that when she reached the foot of the ramp she might not be able to get up it. Since boxer times, the top of the Tartar wall is forbidden as a promenade, save for a short trip just above the legation quarter, and the ramps are stoutly closed at the foot, theoretically. But in China, theory and practice do not always correspond. Mrs. Bowlby knew, and as she hurried, she hoped. Her hope was justified. Through a solid wooden barrier, closed the foot of the ramp. A few feet higher up a little bolt hole, large enough to admit a goat or a small man, had been picked away in the masonry of the parapet. Mrs. Bowlby scrambled through and found herself on the cobbled slope of the ramp. Panting a little, she walked up it onto the wall. The great flag top, broad enough for two motor lorries to drive abreast, stretched away to left and right. A thick undergrowth of thorny brushes had sprung up between the flags, and through them wound a little path, manifestly used by goats and goat herds. Below her, peaking legs spread out a city turned by the trees which grew in every courtyard into the semblance of a green wood out of which rose the immense golden roofs of the forbidden city. Beyond it, far away, the faint mauve line of the western hills hung on the sky. But Mrs. Bowlby had no eyes for the unparalleled view. Peeping cautiously through the battlements, she located the Buick Saloon, shining incongruously, neat and modern in its squalid and deserted surroundings. By it took her bearings and moved with a beating heart along the little path between the thorns. Hoopoos flew out in front of her, calling their sweet note and perched again, raising and lowering their crests. She never heeded them nor her torn silk stockings. Now she was above the car, yes. There was the lane up which they had come, and the wall beyond it was the wall of that house. She could see the doorkeeper, doll-like below her, still standing in a scarlet doorway, watching the car curiously. The garden wall stretched up close to the foot of the city wall itself, so that as she came abreast of it, the whole compound, the house with its manifold courtyards and the formal garden lay spread out at her feet, with a minute perfection of a child's toy farm on the floor. Mrs. Bowlby stood looking down in at it. A dreamlike sense of unreality came over her greater than any yet caused even by her impossible voice. A magnificent white pine, trunk and branches gleaming, as if whitewashed among its dark needles, rose out of the garden, and below it stood a round stone table among groups of lilacs, just as the voice had described it, close by separated from the pine garden by a wall pierced with a fan-shaped doorway, was another with a goldfish pond, like a shamrock, and round it stood a square, pleached alley of acacias. Flowers and grape tubs bloomed everywhere. Here was the very setting of her lover's secret idol. Silent, sunny, sweet, it lay under the brooding protection of the Tartar wall. Here she was indeed near to the heart of her mystery. Mrs. Bowlby felt as she leaned on the stone parapet, looking down at the deserted garden. A strange fancy came to her, that she would have liked to bring Jim here, and people it once again. But she and Jim, she reflected with a little sigh, were stayed married people with no need of a secret haven hidden away in the East City. And with the thought of Jim, the claims of everyday life reasserted themselves. She must go, and with a last glance at the garden, she hastened back to the car. During the next day or so, Mrs. Bowlby brooded over her new discovery, and all that had led to it. Everything, the place where the address had been given by the voice, 
the flicker of recognition on the faces of the servants at the house of the French legation, that fact of the doorkeeper in the East City having mentioned a Fakwa Tai Tai as his late employer, pointed to one thing, that the former owner of the Buick Salon had lived in the house, which he had first called on that momentous afternoon. More than ever, the thing took hold of her. Having penetrated the secret of the voice so far, she felt that she must follow it further yet. Timid or not, she must brace herself to ask some questions. At a dinner a few nights later, she found herself seated next to Mr. Van Adam. Mr. Van Adam was an elderly American, the doyen of Peking society, who had seen everything and known everyone since before boxer days a walking memory and a mine of social information. Mrs. Bowlby determined to apply to him. She displayed unwanted craft. She spoke of legation compounds in general and of the French compound in particular. She praised the garden of the house where she had called, and then, Who lived there before the Vernays came? she asked, and waited eagerly for the answer. Mr. Van Adam eyed her a little curiously, she thought but replied that it was a certain Count de Ardennes. Was he married? Mrs. Bowlby next inquired. Oh, yes, he was married, right enough. But the usual reminiscent flow of antidote seemed to fail, Mr. MacAdam, in this case. Struggling against the vague sense of difficulty of a hitch somewhere, Mrs. Bowlby pushed on nevertheless to an inquiry as to what the Countess de Ardennes was like. A siren, Mr. Van Adam replied briefly, adding, Lovely creature, though, as ever stepped. He edged away rather from the subject, or so it seemed, to Mrs. Bowlby, but she nerved herself to another question. Had they a car? Mr. Van Adam fairly stared at that. Then he broke into a laugh. Car? Why, yes, she went everywhere in a yellow Buick. We used to call it the Canary. The talk drifted off onto cars in general, and Mrs. Bowlby let it drift. She was revolving in her mind the form of her last question. Her curiosity must look odd, she reflected nervously. It was all more difficult somehow than she had expected. Her craft was failing her. She could not think of a good excuse for further questions that would not run the risk of betraying her secret. There must have been a scandal. There would have been, of course, but Mrs. Bowlby was not of the order of women who in Peking asked coolly at the dinner table. And what was her scandal? At dessert and desperation, she put it hurriedly, badly. When did the Ardennes leave? Mr. Van Adam paused before he answered. Oh, going on for a year ago now. She was ill, they said. Looked it anyway and went back to France. He was transferred to Bangkok soon after, but I don't know if she's gone out to him again. The East didn't suit her. Oh, poor thing, murmured Mrs. Bowlby softly and sincerely, her heart full of pity for the woman with a lovely voice and a lovely name, whose failing health had severed her from her shock. Not even love such as hers could control this wretched feeble body, reflected Mrs. Bowlby, whom few places suited. The ladies rose, and too absorbed in her reflection to pay any further attention to Mr. Van Adam, she rose and went with him. At this stage, Mrs. Bowlby went to Piet Ha Ho for the summer. Peking, with a temperature of over 100 degrees in the shade, is no place for delicate women in July and August. Cars were not allowed on the sandy roads of the pleasant, strangling seaside resort and missionaries and diplomatists alike are obliged to fall back on rickshaws and donkeys as a means of locomotion. So the Buick Saloon was left in Peking with Jim, who came down for long weekends as often as he could. Thus separated from her car and in changed surroundings, Mrs. Bowlby endeavored to take stock of the whole affair dispassionately. Get away from it, she could not. Bathing, idling on the hot sunny beach, walking through the green paths bordered with maize and kaoliang, sitting out in the blessedly cool dark after dinner, she found herself as much absorbed as ever in this personality whose secret life she so strangely shared. 
Curiously enough, she felt no wish to ask any more questions of anyone. With her knowledge of Madame Dardenne's name, the sense of eavesdropping had returned full force. One thing struck her as a little odd, that if there had been a scandal, she should not have heard of it. In Peking, where scandals were innumerable and treated with startling openness and frank disregard, perhaps she had been mistaken, though, in Mr. Van Adam's attitude, and there had not been one, or the illumination came to her belated and suddenly. Hadn't Mr. Van Adam's son in the customs, who went home last year, been called Jack? He had, and Mrs. Balby shuddered at the thought of her clumsiness. She could not have chosen a worse person for her inquiries. Another thing, at Pei Tai Ho, she realized with a certain astonishment that she had not been perceptibly shocked by this intrigue. Mrs. Bowlby had always believed herself to hold thoroughly conventional British views on marriage. The late owner of the Buick Saloon clearly had not. Yet Mrs. Bowlby had never thought of censoring her. She had even been a little resentful of Mr. Van Adams calling her a siren. Sirens were cold-hearted creatures who lured men frivolously to their doom. Her voice was not the voice of a siren. Mrs. Bowlby was all on the side of her voice. Didn't such love justify itself, argued Mrs. Bowlby, awake at last to her own moral failure to condemn another, or very nearly? Perhaps she caught herself thinking, if people knew as much about all love affairs as she knew about this one, they would be less censorious. Mrs. Bowlby stayed late at Pei Tai Hao, while on into September, so the breezes blew chilly off the sea, the green paths had faded to a dusty yellow, and the maize and Kaoliang were being cut. When she returned to Peking, she was at once very busy. Calling begins all over again after the seaside holiday, and she spent hours in the Buick saloon, leaving cards. The voice was with her again as before, but something had overshadowed the blissful happiness of the spring days. There was an undertone of distress, of foreboding, often in the conversations. What exactly caused it she could not make out, but it increased, and one day, halfway through October, driving in the East City, the voice dropped away into a burst of passionate sobbing. This distressed Mrs. Bowlby extraordinarily. It was a strange and terrible thing to sit in the car with those low, heartbroken sounds at her side. She almost put out her arms to take and comfort the unhappy creature, but there was only empty air the empty seat with her bag, her book, and her little calling list. Obeying one of those sudden impulses, which the voice alone seemed to call out in her, she abandoned her calls and told, trying to drive to the poor Hua Shang Hotong. As they neared it, the sobs beside her ceased. A murmured apologies for being un peu neve followed. When she reached the house, Mrs. Bowlby got out and again climbed the ramp onto the tartar wall. The thorns and bushes between the battlements were brown and sere, and a hoopoos flew and fluted among them. She reached the spot where she could look down into the gardens. The lilacs were bare now, as her own were. The tubs of flowers were gone, and heaps of leaves had drifted round the feet of the acacias. Only the white pine stood up, stately and untouched by the general decay. A deep melancholy took hold of Mrs. Bowlby, Already taken by the sobs in the car, the desolation of this deserted autumn garden weighed with an intense oppression on her spirit. She turned away slowly and slowly descended to the Buick. The sense of impending misfortune had seized on her too. Something she vaguely felt had come to an end in that garden. As she was about to get into the car, another impulse moved her. She felt an overmastering desire to enter the garden and see its features from close at hand. The oppression still hung over her, and she felt that a visit to the garden might in some way resolve it. She looked in her purse and found a five-dollar note. Handing it to the startled Shuang, Give that, said Mrs. Bowlby, to the Kaimanti, and tell him I wish to walk in the garden of that house. Shuang bowed, rang the bell, conversed. Mrs. Bowlby waited, trembling with impatience till the clinching argument of the note was at last produced, and the old man, whom she had seen before, beckoned to her to enter. She followed him through several courtyards. 
It was a rambling Chinese house, little modernized. The blind paper lattice on the windows looked blankly onto the miniature lakes and rocky landscapes in the open courts. Finally, they passed through a round doorway into the gardens below the Tartar wall. And bowing, the old custodian stood aside to let her walk alone. Before her rose the white pine, and she strolled towards it. And sitting down on a marble bench beside the round stone, the round stone table, gazed about her. Beautiful, even in its decay, melancholy, serene, the garden lay under the battlements, which cut the pale autumn sky behind her. And here the owner of the voice had sat, hidden and secure, her lover beside her. A sudden burst of tears surprised Mrs. Bowlby. Cruel life, she thought, which parts dear lovers. Has she, too, sat here alone? A sharp, unexpected sense of her own solitude drove Mrs. Bowlby up from the seat. This visit was a mistake. Her oppression was not lightened. To have sat in this place seemed somehow to have involved herself in the disaster and misery of that parted pair. She wandered on through the fan-shaped doorway and came to a halt beside the goldfish pond. Staring at it through her tears, she noticed the repair to the coping of which the voice had spoken, where Jacques had made an inscription of the damp mortar. She moved round to the place where it still showed white against the gray surface, murmuring, Maintenant, il s'élit la peau toujours d'un amour. The phrase of the voice had stayed rooted in her mind. Stooping down, she read the inscription scratched out neatly and carefully with a penknife in the fine plaster. Du sepulter mon coeur dans ton coeur, du paradis mon ame dans ton ame. And below two sets of initials, A. De A, De, J, Sent, G, B, B. The verse touched Mrs. Bowlby to fresh tears. It was actually a moment or two before she focused her attention on the initials. When she did, she started back as though a serpent had stung her and shut her eyes and stood still. Then with a curious blind movement, she opened her bag and took out one of her cards and laid it on the coping beside the inscription as if to compare them. This is J. St. G. B. Bowlby. The fine black letters stared up at her, uncompromising and clear from the white oblong besides the capitals cut in the plaster. There could be no mistake. Her mystery was solved at last, but it seemed as if she could not take it in. Jim she murmured, Mrs. Bowlby to herself as if puzzled, and then, Jacques? Slowly, while she stood there, all the connections and verifications unrolled themselves backwards in her mind with devastating certainty and force. Her sentiment, her intuition on the wall, had been terribly right. Something had come to an end in that garden that day. Standing by the shamrock pond, with the first waves of an engulfing desolation sweeping over her, Hardly conscious of her words, she whispered, Pourtant c'est la porte bonne hair, le trife n'est pas? And with a second question from the voice, she seemed at last to wake from the sort of stupor in which she had stood. Intolerable. She must hear no more. Passing back, almost running into the pine garden, she beckoned to the old Cayman tea to take her out. He led her again, bowing through the courtyard to the great gateway. Through the open red and gold door, she saw the Buick saloon, dark and shiny, standing as she had so often, and with what pleasure seen it standing before how many doors. She stopped and looked round her almost wildly. Behind her, the garden. Before her, the Buick. Liu caught sight of her and flew to open the door. But Mrs. Bowlby did not get in. She made Schwann call a rickshaw, and when it came, ordered him to direct the coolie to take her to the bank house. Schwang, exercising the respectful supervision which Chinese servants are wont to bestow on their employers, reminded her that she was to go to the polo to pick up the laoye, Bobby. Before his astonished eyes, his mistress shuddered visibly from head to foot. The bank, the bank, she repeated. 
with a sort of desperate impatience. Standing before the scarlet door, lighting his little black and silver pipe, the old Cayman T watched them go. First the rickshaw, with a small, drooping gray figure in it, lurched down the dusty Huantong, and after it empty bumped the Buick Saloon.